All right, everyone, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, thanks for coming to the 1 o'clock session of finance. This is uh, Maximizing Efficiency Through Cost Analysis, presented by the always lovely Tony Cordova from uh, Prison City Brewery. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Jason. Hey, everybody, my name is Tony. Um, I know almost everybody in here, which is awesome. A lot of really friend friendly faces, so it's cool. That's great. Um, and I'm going to be talking about maximizing your efficiency through cost analysis. Um, how many people in here are business owners? How many of you are penny pinchers? <laughs> All right, most of you are honest. That's good. Cool. All right, so we're going to be uh, going through uh, some very detailed uh, um, uh, looks at uh, cost goods sold, yeast, utility, utilities, waste, kegs, time, storage, transportation. Um, we're gonna compare those things to the industry standards um, that, are, that are available out there. And then we're gonna uh, look at um, making careful considerations as far as uh, what kind of decisions you can make um, uh, based on this data. Okay, I am not an accountant. I'm, I'm a brewer. I, I don't really deal with money, uh, but I am analyzing all of this. I don't pay the bills. Uh, I leave that up to my accountant. Um, but the, that's why this perspective is, I'm coming at this from a much more pragmatic approach uh, so that we can um, actually make decisions on a day to day and kind of and know exactly what's going on in our breweries. Um, I have a passion for sustainability and efficiency. So I have that, that's also a lens that I'm um, looking at this through. Um, and if you also have any other questions or anything, just like raise your hand or whatever, you can interrupt me. There will be taking a lot of breaks um, as we segment through all these ideas, um, and I'll uh, call for questions uh, for that at that time as well. Okay, cost of goods sold. Uh, most of you are probably using an ERP system, probably maybe. Um, there are two types of systems. It's called a, a, a perpetual inventory system, which is going to be your ERP, your Ecos, your Beer 30, and whatnot. And there's a periodic inventory system. Generally, it's going to be spreadsheets uh, that you update manually. Um, I don't really need to go over the pros and cons fully, um, but you can kind of see um, these ERP systems are great to an extent, but they're also very expensive. And um, they're not very customizable. I find the customization in ERP systems to be very, very lacking. Um, and yeah, like I said, expensive. But they keep track of your inventory and your, they track of your uh, cost of goods sold very, very well, which is very nice. Um, spreadsheets are fully customizable. They're time consuming. They're not as precise, but they're cheap. And they are made specifically to your needs. Um, and as you all probably already know. Uh, so you can also just use a combination of both. Uh, uh, I, I use a combination of both. Um, so my cogs are very, very precise, but um, uh, it, for any kind of customization I want on top of that, I have spreadsheets to, uh, to um, uh, go with that. All right. So cost allocation method methodology is basically just the way you, uh, uh, you allocate all of your costs. Um, I'm going to just read this for a second. So cost allocations can be made a number of ways. Best practice is to determine an allocation method methodology to apply to the costs that will be included in cost goods sold. Consistency is key in this process to ensure that costs are reasonable and that the process is inclusive. Once a methodology is determined and adopted, it can be fine-tuned and improved upon to reflect the product cost. So that's where the custom build, customizability comes in. And very, very, very important is to um, be consistent with this, so you can uh, you can compare the data as you go as you go along. Uh, the, this is, comes from the um, the cost of goods sold manual from the Brewers Association. I highly recommend going through it. It's very comprehensive and it's really uh, good. And it's very informative. All right. Um, so yeah, we're going to go through some analysis of spreadsheets next uh, that show how we can track specific costs in the brewery. Uh, lots of the numbers you see are not completely accurate, um, but they are relatively close to what I've seen in the past. Um, and any of the um, spreadsheets that I show you, I'm happy to send a template to anybody that wants it. Um, and uh, just email me. Um, my email will be up there, and I'll have uh, business cards as well. OK, so this is a, an example of my, um, my recipe sheet when I make, make a beer. Um, this is a, a brewing log that has the cost of goods sold built in to the, um, into the log. Um, as you can see, uh, you just input your grain on the left. It's really blurry, so sorry about that. Um, so grain goes in the left, it, it spits out the cost and how much I'm using, and um, this is just like the 
top part of that spreadsheet. Um, and then I, as, as I brew the beer, I just put in the things that I, um, that I put into the beer. That goes to a centralized inventory spreadsheet that I edit when I buy ingredients. And, um, and then that pulls that data into the spreadsheet and uh, gives me a cost. So you can see on the right is our, the packaging log of this specific beer. Um, it gives me yield. It gives me um, uh, uh, cost of uh, the package and it gives me um, uh, the cost per barrel. So all of that is integrated so that I know that um, if I'm gonna make, uh, do 16 half barrels, that half barrel with the cake cost, with everything, is gonna cost me $52.33, or whatever it is, because it's kind of blurry. Um, uh, and, and then you can also break out, like, so this is very, very good information when you're trying to decide how you want to allocate that beer in package. Uh, it gives you a, 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 a a view you can it's a viewpoint into whether that is actually going to be making you money if you do put it all in kegs or if you put it all in, in cans or whatever you decide to do whatever works the best for you um, so having this information is vital to the, those kinds of decision makings mm -hmm. do you have any questions about this brewing log yes uh, like for the cost per item then is that just your material costs uh, that is not factoring in overhead, and we're going to talk about a little bit about that later. Um, but that is just going to be the liquid and the packaging material. Um, that's the, the the cost the cost goods sold in that situation. This is a real example, of a real spreadsheet. Yes, yeah. This is a spreadsheet I built over about ten years. <laughs> so no, I mean the numbers. Then, like, oh, your case is a whole case is seventeen dollars. Yep. It's including everything. Yep. Liquid. Yep. <laughs> but your but your keg. Is 52. Yes, so that so a case has 24 cans in it, yeah. and the cans are 14 cents a piece. The label is 25 cents a piece. The lid is five cents a piece. All that. Actually, you know what I can do? Is that doing label or no label? No label. No label. Yes. No labor. No labor. No. And um, time and stuff. I will show you. I must agree. No, this is great. No, that's awesome. Um, there, are no there are no dumb questions. All right, here we go. This is this is the um, the brew sheet. Okay. So uh, actually, one thing before I answer that question specifically, I wanted to point out also this gives time as well. So you you can go down to the bottom here, and the bash in to the knockout time is five hours. So that is also where you can apply a cost if you wanted to. You could say, okay, my brewer gets paid such and such an hour. That five that five hours costs me that payroll, whatever. Um, so. All this stuff can be integrated in this kind of thing. It's actually like kind of cool when you start doing it, um, but it's fully customizable to your needs. Anyway, so I'm going to go to the packaging info, and um, the packaging here is I, I created a, a, a recipe basically. So the recipe is a four by six case. The cans, so 24 cans, cost me four dollars and eighty cents. One case tray, 56 cents. All that gets added up. So my total for a four by six case is $9.92 just for packaging material. So you add that to the, um, your cost per barrel. So this is your liquid cost? This, this cost right here, this cost per barrel is my liquid cost. Okay. As soon as I put it into a case here, I add that liquid cost, you know, the, the, yeah. the liquid cost to the packaging, and that's where that number comes from. But it doesn't include your labor cost, your machine time. You can, you can integrate that if you want to, okay. absolutely. Um, uh, and that's where I was talking about, like, say, the, the, yeah. the total brewing time, you can apply that cost to that if you want. And that includes, all the, that includes fermentation time, that includes packaging time, labor. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> that's, that's really, really hard to, like, apply to something like this. Um, and that's, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit as we move uh, through this presentation. But um, all those, com those, those costs are very hard to put into here. So, but here, what I have is a baseline. And that baseline is going to tell me, um, uh, uh, give, that's going to be my consistent portion of that cost analysis. Any questions about that? Uh, yeah. So along his line, so on the case, does that include the cost of cleaning chemicals and all that stuff? Or is that, again, in another video? That would be in another type of thing, but you can. Uh, so that's just liquid cost. Yes, yeah. You're. Thanks. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to, you could also put like, and we'll talk about it later, but it's like it's just so hard to calculate. It's so specific to uh, different people. But in your packaging recipe, you could apply that. So yeah. you say, um, I need three people on the canning line. Um, that labor is going to cost me X amount. Gotcha. By all means, do that. Yep, yep. Um, and and we'll, kegging is less labor intensive, so that's going to be cheaper. Is that good? Cool? Sweet. All right. All right. So I built, yeah, I started building this a long time ago, and I've been slowly refining it and refining it and refining it, and yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> uh, but it's been fun because you learn so much, like all the calculations and everything. Actually, the reason I started to do it was because um, I wanted to learn more about brewing calculations, and so I bought, there's a great book, it's, I think it's just like the book of brewing calculations is what it's called or something. And, uh, and I just like put it all on a spreadsheet and, and learned all about it. And you get a better understanding of that There's stuff. There's a speaker in another session that talked about the fundamental principle of know how to use Excel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I find I, I never learned it like early on. But I continue to learn, oh, that's how you do that. Yeah. And I am like mildly adept at Excel. I am not, there, this that spreadsheet could probably be way, way better if I was better at Excel, but you know, whatever works for you, honestly. Um, okay, so yeah, like we're gonna talk about labor costs here. I, I didn't break this out because it's so specific to so many people and everything, and people handle it in different ways as well. Um, but you know, we, as we talked about, margins might be higher for cans versus kegs, but labor costs are also higher. Um, high variety of tasks and multitasking makes these numbers really hard to calculate. Um, understand the dots and margins and processes that are more or less labor intensive. So maybe you do want to lean into more cakes because you are spending less um, on the, the labor of that. Um, and craft beer is like unique and, and labor and payroll is often an afterthought. Find a balance between vanity and uh, profitability. Uh, you know, we can add Amaretti to um, a beer and it'll taste like cherries, or we could do carbonic maceration, which is fun and cool, but which one's more cost effective? Um, you know, but you can do both, dude. I, I love carbonic maceration, but um, you know, it, you gotta balance that. You know, and sometimes you just wanna have fun and you wanna, like, yeah, grill some pineapple on outside and put it in your beer. It's cool, you know, you don't need to. <laughs> um, but then another thing uh, that I wanna kind of drive home with when you're going into labor costs is that it, it's a fine line between like understanding all this and then being a micromanager. Um, nobody likes a micromanager. And once you start like really focusing on that kind of stuff, you can tend, you tend to be like micromanaging. So I try to like have a broad view of it all, understand it, but don't like be so strict about it. Uh, and I lost my notes because where am I? Do uh, you have any questions about labor on that? Well, yeah, I'll give you a quick question. Yep. So, so some of the projects I've been on, you know, you really, uh, you know, you use charge cards and timesheets and, yep. and folks different, you know, different tasks, different submarines, different projects, whatever. They charge you different numbers. How, how, my, how far do you drill down with your staff in the brew house as far as keeping track? I mean, is it simple? Five hours cleaning kegs, three hours cleaning fermenters? Yes. So you do it at some sort, at some level. Of that. And, and actually, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit about that later also. Uh, but uh, what you can do is, you, you know, I know that beer uh, took five hours to brew. And I know that cleaning a tank, as soon as the tank is empty, um, uh, I can have it cleaned and sanitized in two hours. So you can apply those numbers to what you're doing. But I would, I would say that that is more, it's, it's harder to, to add, put a cost to that and more um, uh, exercise in like being efficient in the brewery. So you can schedule things better and then you create more of a, a better flow. Um, so, but yeah, but we'll talk about that later too. Yeah. What point did you make it, uh, make the decision to calculate your labor bottom up versus top down? Meaning that you know, like for my clients, sometimes they ask me, how much labor do I put for, for <coughs> And my answer is normally, well, how much you spend over a year, how many hours you made, we'll do it, and then capture. Yeah. That is probably like the best way to do it. And actually, that's, it's funny because that a lot of the ways that you have to calculate these very hard things to calculate is exactly that. Say, like, you know, we buy this much in a month, 
how many barrels do we make that month? That's going to be your cost per barrel of, of your labor or whatever it is. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Good. Cool. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So yeah, just have a full understanding of how, what it, the labor that is going into your product is going to be where you make the best decisions. Okay. So yeast costs uh, calculations. Um, Calculating yeast cost is a very difficult thing, um, and I don't think there's anybody that really has a great answer for it. Um, you can do full yeast, the cost of yeast fully absorbed in the first beer, so that beer just has all the yeast cost and every beer that you use after that, that uses that yeast, the yeast is free. Cool, but it's kind of inconsistent. Um, you can average the total monthly yeast cost over uh, the number of batches brewed regardless of the yeast strain, and that's what uh, we do. Um, and then you can also retroactively divide the cost of the yeast among the beers brewed with it. It's time consuming, it's wishy-washy, so I would probably, I, it's, it, it doesn't really work that well. Um, here's an example of uh, the spreadsheet that we use. So in November we bought uh, three uh, batches or three um, uh, yeast in that month and we uh, packaged 570 barrels. So that gives us a cost per barrel of $6.94. Very simple. Once you start doing that, then you can put in a spreadsheet that will give you an average over the year. So I have only been doing this, this yeast cost analysis for about three months, four months. So um, this uh, data is obviously incomplete, but we are working towards, um, uh, we'll see what's happening in, uh, once we get to December. Um, uh, and then and if I go a month and I see a big spike, then I can say, okay, what, about, what, what happened there? Or if it's really low, I can say what happened there. Maybe my cost was a lot lower, and it's because we uh, organized the um, organized the brew schedule a lot better. So um, just try to th those things will give you points to look at and analyze what you're doing in the brewery, and um, then you can make a good decision on whether that was good for you um, in the uh, or whether that that what you did that month learn from what you did that month to lower that cost. Any questions about yeast? If anybody has any tips on how to um, calculate yeast costs, I am, would love to hear them, but I've never heard anybody give me good ones. So <laughs> we had to kind of like, you know, come up with this, and this works pretty well. Um, all right. Gas and electric. Uh, understanding the gas and electric pills is a nightmare. Um, I, I dove into NYSEG bills for a couple weeks and had a really hard time figuring it all out. I ended up figuring it out in a way, and um, it's really dumb. So, uh, but it, it's good to under, understand like what is happening. Um, billing is, it, consistency is often not good. Um, the, sometimes it's monthly, sometimes it's every other month, sometimes they just forget. Um, and uh, same, so, with, so that's with NYSEG or with uh, your gas and electric. Um, also, do meter readings. Everybody should be doing meter readings. Do not take estimates. Do your meter readings, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Okay, so waste water and wastewater. Um, collect your, collect your uh, water bills. We are, we are billed quarterly, um, and the CCF, that's uh, uh, hundreds of cubic feet of, of water is usually what they measure it in. Um, and then getting this information will help you get to your cost or your, your uh, usage per barrel. And we'll go over that in a little bit too. Sewer rents, it, most of the time you are uh, getting a bill for your water and you have a sewer rents portion of that. That is basically they're charging you the sewer based on how much water you brought in. Well, don't forget, a lot of that water that you just use is going in your beer. So you're getting charged for sewer rents that is not that you're not putting down the sewer. Most times you can probably talk to the water people and they'll be like, we don't care. Um, but I have seen situations where they're like, oh yeah, uh, tell us how much water is going into your beer and we'll deduct that from your, uh, from your bill. Um, and then the other thing is cross-referencing. So that's another big part of this is like, you know, we get our bills, we pay them, whatever. But actually, if you have the, the if you put this data into a spreadsheet and figure it out, we figured out that uh, the cost of our wastewater went up almost 40% and nobody told us. And I only found out because I was cross-referencing the data and we should have been getting charged a certain amount. And then this month, all of a sudden it went up. We didn't know why. And then we ended up figuring it out uh, relatively quickly. Um, okay, so uh, this is an example of our costs for NYSEG. This is, uh, this is just, uh, this is, uh, Gas, yeah. 
Is it gas? Yeah. Yes, yeah, gas. <laughs> it's, it's blurry, sorry. Um, look, at this, look at this curve. It's ridiculous. It's because every green um, uh, reading was an actual reading. Every yellow reading was a estimated reading. So this data gives me nothing. I can't make any decisions on this. I cannot understand uh, like if like something got left on. I can't understand anything about this. So that's why you have to do meter readings. This is like it's it. They actually like really pisses me off that not, we have to do meter readings and they can't. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, this is a good example of why um, uh, uh, you should be doing meter readings so that you can get good actual data that is usable. Also, variability in price. See the price. Um, there's, oh no, not on this one, on electric. Okay, on electric, the rate changes all the time. So right here is our rate, and it changes every month. The, the, the demand change changes. Excuse me? Changes. changes your time of day, too. Yep, it, it's all, if it's all. you're running at 2 a.m., it's way better than running at 9 yes. So what you have is a, de a demand charge on your on your uh, on your uh, gas or your electric bill. That demand charge is just to say, hey, you use a lot of electricity, and we're gonna keep the generator running, and um, we're gonna charge you for that. It's like, well, okay, like now you're getting charged, you know, eighteen hundred dollars because they just leave their generators on, <laughs> or and and it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> so um, as you can see. Uh, the yellow um, reading was an estimate, and look what happened. Our our data is like is flawed. So do your meter readings. Any questions about this? On your gas slide. Yep. Is the uh, the peaks and valleys that represent the volatility in price as well? Nope, nope. That is just because it's an estimated reading and not an actual reading. So do you? Because like we had signed up for um, like a natural gas price fixed contract. Sweet. Yeah. To try to our pricing of gas. Yeah. But, you know, if we consume more, we're paying obviously more per month. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so do you guys do that? Do you use it? No, we don't. That would be something that we might want to look into. I haven't really gotten that far yet, but absolutely. Like, all, a lot of stuff is negotiable, but, you know, these uh, nice thing is also just hard to work with anyway. Yeah, and, so. can, and maybe participating. Blue Rock, what did they become? They actually were sponsored for a while. Yeah, I don't know. The successor kind of screws us. <laughs> so I them, but, uh, yeah. Well, and that's the other thing. You can go with any um, energy provider, um, but you, in in my experience, when I've looked into that, it, you're not really saving much money, or you're not saving any money really. So, um, but I think we should definitely look into it. I mean, do the due diligence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, this also calculates everything cost per barrel and also um, usage per barrel. So as you can see on the right, um, our cost per barrel for natural gas was uh, four dollars and thirty six cents um, average, and the uh, um, the uh, usage was four dollar or I'm sorry four point five seven therms. This data will will also uh, I'll show you uh, a comparison to the industry standards. Is this uh, including the electric and the gas for the tap room? Um, yes, is the short answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, our water is separate, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but and that's stuff that you have to consider. You have to consider what's. How um, many meters have you got? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions about this specifically? Just a quick comment. On, uh, I, I checked with your local water guys, the Oakwood mm -hmm. guys, when I told them, hey, you know, I need to split out some of this so we're charging and tracking wastewater. They have tons. Of, they had tons of leftover meters. Really nice mm. meters because they replaced everything with these digital remote ones. And the guy, he just had a bin of these meters. Oh, the okay. time he came around, he left one in the driveway for me. And I mean, they're they're really good. So if yeah. you just split stuff out, hey, talk to the local guys who are driving around. They might help you out. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we talked to our water people oh, quite a bit, and I will show you in a moment why. <laughs> Just to add on to that, there are similar things available for electricity. Oh, yeah. So, yep. you know, I assume your production space is probably on a separate distribution panel. You could probably sub meter it. Yeah, we've been working with RIT on a sustainability uh, uh, assessment, and they were kind of talking about doing that. So that's something that we might tackle soon. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the water and wastewater situation. 
Um, we, so all of our water is metered in and all of our waste is metered out. So as you can see, this is our usage um, over a month. Um, you know, obviously Thursdays are pretty, we're pretty busy. We're brewing three times almost every Thursday. Um, and then the weekends are going to be really, really low. So this is all data that we collected and um, put to really good use because now I can look at like, hey, it's hard, I know it's hard to see, but down here on the left, um, the, we have the amount of barrels that we packaged and then we have uh, the, the water to beer ratio. And that water to beer ratio in this instance is 6.6 .6 gallons for every gallon of beer, which is okay. Um, and so now we can keep an eye on that every month. So every month I collect all this data, put it in, in my water uh, spreadsheet, and I know exactly what my um, water to beer ratio is. If it goes high, I can go, okay, well, what's going on? Or if it starts creeping up and it doesn't stop, it doesn't stop going back down, then we need to reassess our SOPs. And then we'll talk about wastewater a little bit later, but wastewater is a nightmare. So hopefully you guys have all figured it out already. <laughs> Any questions about that? No? Cool. Okay, keg cost is a very difficult one as well. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions about it, and I don't have a whole lot of answers, unfortunately. But um, we use cost per fill. So we do uh, our, our kegs are $11 for a half barrel and $9 for a six stall, and I put that directly into my cost of goods sold spreadsheet. Um, if you're buying your own kegs, just treat them like any other piece of equipment. Uh, another thing that I found really interesting is the keg loss cost. If you are, if you are, if you have your own kegs, your purchased kegs, uh, according to um, this article, uh, you're losing. It's about 82 cents to a dollar 35 per barrel produced that you're losing on kegs. I thought that was pretty interesting, but um, I didn't really. When I read the article, didn't really understand the methodology, but um, I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's actually. Asset yeah, basically. So, like, you, you know, you lose kegs at all the time. It's about they go? yeah, yeah, exactly. And they they figured it was about between eighty two cents and a dollar thirty five a keg. That's two thousand. Uh, yeah, two thousand. Yeah. So, oh. we use keg logistics. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they are. Is there kind of an industry standard for uh, keg Yes, there are. There is. I don't, off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but there are standards out there. The BA has published standards for that. Um, I know it's out there. Um, and then always consider cake storage. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute too, but uh, you know, cost per square foot. Um, if you have empty cakes just sitting there, how much is it costing you just to sit there? Um, it's, a good, uh, it's a good thing to think about if you're thinking about buying your own cakes. Okay, so a cost per square foot, here we go. Uh, so let's pre pretend that our, uh, we're at 95 cents a square foot um, per month. Um, if we wanna leave a standard pallet um, on the floor, not doing anything, it costs you $12.58 a month for something to just sit there. I know it's something that's like, kind of like, we take space for granted because you're paying for it anyway, but understanding this really helps you uh, become more efficient and utilize your space in a better way. Um, so yeah, here's just some examples. So like 20 barrel tank or barrels on racks, like we age barrels on racks for a year. So if it's 43 cents a day, $12.07 a month, it's, a, it's costing you that much for a year. Um, it's not a whole lot, but it's something to consider. You're basing that on the rent tank? Yeah, or whatever, whatever you want to lump into. That was just an example, but um, anything you want to lump, uh, lump into like rent, taxes, or, or mortgage, or whatever you want. You're that to the COGS? This I'm not applying to COGS. It's just, a, just yeah. an understanding. Yeah, yeah. You could, I guess, if you if you wanted to like really take that and say, okay, a 20 barrel tank sits here uh, for a year, um, it's going to cost you 2365 uh, times 12. And then, um, yeah, you could apply that to a beer that's sitting in there for 12 days. It costs you that much. Just in space, just in sitting there. So. I would find it really hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think a lot of people who are building out uh, take vertical real estate for granted. So, yeah, like anything you can stack on top, awesome. Okay. 
Okay, and the transportation costs, um, uh, the IRS uh, standard mileage rate is 67 cents per mile. Um, you have payroll, you have distance driven, you have time. So here's an example. Um, if you have 20 cases of beer, transported 28 miles round trip, takes one hour, payroll for the driver is $25 an hour. There's all the math, you're adding $2.19 to every case that you are delivering. So if you're delivering one case, it's not very cost effective to be uh, doing that. Um, then you look at something like a uh, longer trip, like 20 kegs, 440 miles, uh, $25 an hour, takes nine hours, uh, $25.99 to the cost of each keg. That keg that you're selling for $175 just now, um, you just lost 20% uh, of your, your, your revenue. And quite, oh, uh, and then also like, uh, utilize um, route planning software. Um, there's some free stuff out there. Most of it is is, is uh, um, paid. But if you're self-distro, I think it's valu extremely valuable because it'll give you an idea of the best way to go and um, the most efficient way to go. Because if you're going back and forth all the time, that's just costing you more money as well. Any questions about transportation? Is there any kind of like, uh, rule of thumb about how much like, the minimum order amount how many miles? Oh, that would be that would be up to you. Um, you know, you, you just want to maximize it as much as possible. Um, you know, you can do whatever's worth it to you. Yeah. And just you can, but now you can do the math. So yeah. Okay, so here are the industry industry standards. Oh, actually, I wanted to say also like. All the stuff that I showed, you can also do for CO2. I don't have an example for CO2, but CO2 is very simple. You just um, get your monthly bill and divide it by the barrelage, um, just like you would like yeast, um, and keep track of that as well. Uh, so here are the industry standards here. Um, this is uh, data that's from uh, 2017 to 2021. Um, keep in mind there's COVID in, between, in there. So uh, these numbers are good, but they, there's also like a big thing in the middle of that. Um, so uh, this comes from the BA Sustainable Benchmarking um, uh, page, and uh, it's very, very valuable. Um, there's a whole, this is just for uh, 1,000 to 10,000 barrels, so they have lists of every other size too. It's really, really good. And you know, follow, figure out where you fall in line. Um, we found out that uh, with, with anything that we have, uh, of all the tracking that I'm doing, anything that doesn't fall in line, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at that first. I'm trying to figure out how I get that lower. And that's like the low hanging fruit. That's the easy stuff that you can tackle right away. And then if you get a win, then you feel better about it and you want to keep going. So. Yeah, so and then 2025 is going to be the next benchmark. So that'll be a really interesting one. The, the BA uh, has a benchmarking tool as well. You can input all the data that you're collecting that I've just shown you uh, into their benchmarking tool and compare yourself to other breweries. Uh, it's a very, very cool tool, but it is kind of a lot of work <laughs> and it's a little cumbersome, but it's very good information. All the data, that the industry standard data that we have here comes from this benchmarking tool, so I highly encourage everybody to participate. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. Okay, so now let's add up all the extra costs. So this is um, an example of um, that $17.79 case that we're talking about. Um, so that's our cost of goods sold, right? Now I'm adding my water cost. Now I'm water adding my weight, wastewater cost. Now I'm adding my gas cost, my electric cost, yeast cost, and CO2 cost. These are all based on dividing those costs among the barrelage that we, that we make. So now that, that beer that's in that case now costs us $21.71. So we're adding $3.92 just in that, um, the, uh, the, the utilities and yeast. And then here's an example of a keg, half barrel. So it costs us $52.23 to create that half barrel. And same thing, all these things are laid out and now it costs us uh, $20.27 on top of that $52. So now that half barrel costs us that much more. Um, this is a pretty easy one to put together. Um, so now I can actually like I just drop down menu. You know, I, I pick what I what I'm choosing and I and I can see how much it, how much more it costs. Any questions about that? I'm just amazed that wastewater and yeast are the drivers of your cost. So so we'll get to wastewater in a, in a minute, but um, and you'll see why. But yes, yeast also like you know I and the thing with yeast is I don't know of an industry standard of how much you should be spending on yeast. So if you have that, that'd be great too. And uh, Jesse and I were talking about it yesterday, it's like, is this number right? I don't know. <laughs> so. How many do for life cycle? Uh, six generations, yeah. yeah. And then um, 
depending on, uh, you know, there's things that we could do that are like a little bit better, but our system is really tight right now. Um, so what's, if, if this number is unreasonable, then we can, we'll probably do, tackle it. Is it just those three strains, or do you have other ones that's three strains? Oh yeah, this includes all the strains that we use. Okay, so, so that was my, that was just that's just an example of that month, okay. yeah. Any questions about this again? I guess since we're talking about yeast, yep. um, so I think you know we, we talked yesterday yep. about how it's what we've talked about a lot, and this is great for adding up like your total cost. But I was wondering if there's any use, just from your perspective, of the way we've been looking at it is like by line item, and then tracking lineage and generational use of that specific strain, and mm -hmm. seeing like do you, do you find value if you were to do that for like a specific brand you have. You can maybe try to change your scheduling around, bring that cheaper brand more for that yeast strain, or change your planning around. Do you yep. value in that? Absolutely. Talking with customers about it is Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think that that's actually really awesome, and I think if we, for like example, we use mass right as our our seventy percent of our production. Um, if we made it a line item specifically for that brand because we brew it so often, then absolutely. But when you start like having so many different brands and so many different maybe strains or whatever, then it becomes like harder. You know, and there are brands that we make that we use the yeast once, and that could be that applied to that cost if you wanted to. Um, but you know, also remember consistency is key. So you know, if you then you're like having a completely separate cost analysis on one thing that is not uh, affected by anything else, then you have to, you basically have to create another system for it, if that makes sense. Um, so like this way I kind of like, it's all lumped in, that's, it's good, if I want, if I need to get deeper, I will. Yeah, that makes sense. So like you get the liquid cost for like a specific brand, mm -hmm. you can see it being applied there, yeah, yeah. and it also being applied here is the thing Yep, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I like that a lot actually. If we could, and then we could like be like, oh yeah, mass right is this cost because, of that, the, the yeast is precisely um, added to it. Any other questions about that? Cool. Okay, so now we're kind of the, the make informed decisions por portion of this, uh, uh, this, this talk. Um, you have the data, now what are you gonna do about it? Uh, find, the high, find the high cost centers to tackle them first. Those are the ones that are gonna be, uh, create the most impact, obviously. So if you, for example, are wastewater, that was that, it was like 10 bucks for a barrel or something like that. We're, that's the first thing we're going to look at. That's the first thing we're going to tackle. It's outside of the industry standard, so that is the number going to be our number one priority. And then find the low-hanging uh, fruit and uh, achieve some goals. You know, when you start achieving goals, then you get momentum and you uh, continue to to um, want to do more and and want to uh, improve your process. Okay, so water and wastewater. Um, our wet water and wastewater costs were three times the in the industry average. So what we did is we did the cost breakdown, which I just showed you. Oh, I showed a part of it. Uh, we identified the high charges. We consulted with peers and experts. We made sure the samples were not bad because we, that was definitely a concern. Like, why are, the, why are our uh, results so inconsistent? Bad sampling could possibly be that. This is actually, the, so this chart is, a, is an example of the surcharges that we have um, based on BOD, TSS. Uh, and all that ones. And you can see how wildly inconsistent they are. Um, so bad sampling was a, a, a focus of ours. So we had to come up with a solution because the uh, number was getting unreasonable, like absolutely unreasonable and out of, out of line. So we thought about selling tanks. We uh, have a digester right down the road. Um, we do side streaming and we do pump outs. All these things are very expensive. So let me, so let me get this understand this. So your wastewater is going to like a public sewer. So yes. Yep. They sample it yep. and they charge you based on the chemistry analysis. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Do, and, I mean, obviously they don't, they don't need the water, right? I mean, a lot of the public sewer systems are right. coverage manufacturing because they yeah. get water and the water helps all the pump, pump work, mm -hmm. basically, right? So to, to that point, which is great, um, talk to your wastewater people because I've worked at breweries where we talk to them and they're like, yeah, put whatever you want down. And now I'm at a brewery that they're like, they're all over us. yeah, they're all over us. I'm so. curious how many people are on the Public? Yeah, public. And then who's on just like a, a septic system on the site? Yeah. It still costs me, it still costs me uh, 
thousand dollars a year for a permit and, and sampling. Yep. Which is twice. Uh, our sampling, just for the sampling, is over. It's like three hundred fifty dollars a month, just for samples. <laughs> so. And all of that, all of that, that those numbers go into that sheet and gives me the number, the cost per barrel of, of waste. Uh, I'm curious too, on the people that are on the sewer, how many, because this is amazing, I mean, we're on sewer in a small village in one of our locations. Yeah. They're, they're the one of the ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, anybody else have to deal with this? Like, is this like specific to you? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, it, it's, it's, it's very specific to us, but their surcharges are a very real thing in the brewing industry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, again, talk to your, your local place, you know, like what, what, talk to your, uh, your wastewater management um, uh, people because they will, they're, they're, they're relatively helpful um, and, they, and they also want you to succeed as well. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we, but, but, but like, so like with all that, this is our reality. So now we're sitting at a situation where we have things going down the drain that we cannot put down the drain um, and we need to figure out a solution. Okay, so now in this example, uh, this, uh, we make 5,500 barrels a year. Um, we have a digester like five minutes away. Uh, that is, that, uh, I think it's called Cayuga Digester or something like that. Um, we went through all of these scenarios about how to move forward, but the best scenario, which unfortunately, it, unfortunately, it's the best scenario is side streaming. So when we side stream, we can do a couple of things. We can put it in totes, it's dirty and inconvenient. We have to truck that, those totes somewhere. Um, so we get a tanker truck would be awesome. You know, just put all the waste in the tanker truck, but then we, we have to have a tanker truck. It's space, it's expensive, and the person who's driving it has to have a CDL. That's $4,000 a year. Or we have a large tank that gets pumped out. Every pump out that we do is like $1,800. So now we're talking about doing a pump out once every, I don't know, that's only 2,000 gallons. So you're talking about a lot of money for a week. You're talking about $2,000 a week just to get pumped out. And when you do the math, that number is no longer very good. So now is it a, are we at a point where who cares? The surcharges are what they are and they are, it, it, nothing is cheaper. But we found a solution. So we took a sample to the digester, a sample of our waste, and they analyzed it and they said they would take it for eight cents a gallon. So now eight cents a gallon, awesome. I'll, it's great, eight cents a gallon. Uh, we found a driver and a truck that said, hey, you know what, I'll leave my truck here. It's a 2,000 gallon truck. Give me 200 bucks a week and we'll, uh, we'll haul it to the digester for you. No brainer. So now we're looking at maximum for hauling and getting rid of our waste, $1,440 a month. That's, <laughs> that's like almost half of what we, we, were, we were paying. The upfront costs are gonna be recirculation pump and plumbing, it's nothing in the long run. So, and also I wanted to say, based on this, we got very, very lucky. Like the, finding the driver thing is awesome and, and we're lucky to have that. So take that with a grain of salt a little bit, but you know, there are scenarios where you can get really lucky. Did that just happen or did you, did you look for, like put that word out that we're looking for someone? Actually, well, yeah, um, so Dawn's here. Um, she uh, knew somebody that like, she just asked, somebody about it and they knew somebody or something like that? Is that what happened? Uh, somebody I went to high school with, <laughs> yeah. we are in farm country. I called them, I'm like, do you know any of your farming buddies have trucks? Would they want to, you know, just kind of threw it out there to throw yeah. spaghetti in the wall and somebody yeah. happened to yeah. want to do it. We're like, yeah. hallelujah. Oh yeah, right, right, right. Um, and, and to be clear also, we have not implemented this yet. This is like basically on our front door right now, but it is not fully implemented, just so you know. Um, but this is like, this is what we're looking at. This is the, the decision that we're gonna be moving towards. Um, and we had to do all that due diligence to figure out a solution that would hopefully, that would work for us. Okay, and then in the next example, I'm gonna talk about yeast management. Um, yeah, like we're, the yeast is a big part of our uh, cost, so. Um, I collect the monthly cost and compare the monthly production. Um, that'll give us our cost per barrel, which you saw earlier. Um, compare this uh, month to month. Um, identify the types of yeast and how many times you buy and use them. So if you're using an excessive amount of varieties, obviously you're going to need to um, uh, uh, consolidate a little bit. Uh, consolidate strains, create brands that, that can change generations, generations of yeast, create starters. Um, last year I talked about uh, creating starters and um, it was pretty well received and how you can make a lot, you can save a lot of money on that. Uh, Jesse did one yesterday, that was awesome. So when that gets posted, definitely watch that. Um, 
And then uh, shipping costs are an interesting one too because a lot of the suppliers uh, calculate shipping in different ways. For example, um, uh, Berkeley, Berkeley East, uh, they don't charge you shipping if you buy over $1,000. So when you're buying Berkeley East, making sure it's over $1,000 because then you get, you save $300 in shipping. Uh, um, and like uh, White Labs, White Labs is like a percentage of the sale, I think. Yeah, so in that case, it doesn't really matter how much you buy it. Like shipping is what, is what it is. All right. Any questions about yeast management? Because that is a very big one. You can save a lot of money on yeast management. We do not propagate, yeah, but um, in a way we kind of do. So like, well, like a, a good example is actually like create a brand. Somebody here said it earlier, uh, create a brand that is like lower um, alcohol and, and so you can buy a smaller pitch or smaller starter and that will give you all the yeast that you want for your higher gravity beers. Your uh, six generations that you said, that's a uh, personal choice in terms of like how you like to see the beer or something? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a choice that uh, came basically from Sam, which I agree with. Um, but uh, yeah, like as you start getting in higher generations and our lab is fine, but um, you know, you, you get run into mutations. If you start seeing over attenuation, under attenuation, whatnot, then it, it just gotta get to know your yeast. You know, if your yeast is, uh, acts start a little bit different than it's time. And then around six generations is where we figured out like, that's probably good, yeah. Okay, so then um, just some general considerations about like all of the things that we've been talking about. Um, you know, look at your high concentration of wastewater surcharges hauling. You can actually adjust your recipes um, based on that information. Uh, maybe use uh, uh, like hop um, alternatives or um, you know other products that could help uh, lower your waste. Um, your water beer ratio. Try to get that lower. Um, you know, also when we're talking about water beer ratio, the more concentrated that waste is, the higher our surcharges, so then we run into that situation. But uh, getting your, your, your water to beer ratio is usually uh, always a good goal. Um, you know, and that could be CIP, SOPs, that could be uh, brew house water usage tracking, um, which is all very, very easy to do. Uh, utilities, identify and control equipment that have high energy draws, do your meter readings so you have good data. Uh, dumping out a code product, is, is it always, is it better to have too much or not enough? That's going to be a personal decision for you guys. Um, dumping product is never fun. I hate it. Um, we all hate it. Um, but uh, that's all product that you put time and money into and now it's going down the drain. Uh, time, how much is your time worth? Create expectations for how long tasks will take. Um, we'll kind of talk that, about that in a moment. I know we're getting kind of close. Um, organization is so, so important. Have that inventory organization. Uh, maximize your efficiency with shipping costs. Uh, consider volume rates uh, and consider your space uh, uh, your space constraints. Uh, data. Make sure it's easily accessible. I have all my data right here, right in front of me. If I need to know something, I can get it for you in five seconds. Um, why, understand why your data is the way it is. Why are you doing the things that you have? Why why is it? Why is your charge this much? All that. Understanding why is vital. Um, investigate anomalous data. If you, something seems off, investigate it. You'll figure it out, and maybe you can make a better decision after that. Blue brewery flow, flow and throughput. We'll go over that in a moment. Um, but then the last thing is understand your limitations. What are you capable of? What is your team capable of? And what uh, is your space capable of? Once you understand that, then you can make very good decisions about efficiency. What do you guys think about all that? Cool. Yeah. All right. So I, uh, I'm gonna go with over uh, brew flow and throughput, which is um, a very good way to like be to increase efficiency in your brewery. You understand timing um, and production rhythm. Uh, this is an idea that came from uh, this amazing book by Wolfgang Kunze. You should definitely read it if you haven't. Um, but you have a flow of a scheduled flow. So your brewing, CIP, fermenter, transfer, and packaging, you know exactly how much time that all takes. And then you can create good, um, good production management uh, knowing those things. I know that brewing that beer took me five hours. That gives me three hours left in the day to do something else. For example, CIP, which takes exactly two hours. Fermentation, set, day seven, I'm harvesting and I'm dry hopping. Day nine, I'm crashing. Day 12, I'm transferring through the centrifuge into the bright tank. Uh, Day, was that day 11? Ugh, I forgot. Um, day, and then the next day I'm packaging and now I have a uh, mass riot in people's hands in 13 days. This could also mean, when, you, when, you, when you're efficient like this, this could also mean that you don't have to have extra labor. So you, that keeps your, uh, that means you're not um, over, uh, over staffing. 
that makes sense? That's cool. Good. Any questions about that? No? Cool. It's so, it's so key. Having good flow is such a key thing. And then I just want to briefly talk about taproom flow. I, I'm not a taproom. I don't run a taproom or anything like that, but I just some observations, I guess. Um, customer come in, know exactly where to go, exactly know how to, how to order, know how to pay. And, and move on to sit down and enjoy their beer. Um, one of my hugest pet, pet peeves is if I walk in and I don't know what to do. It's just, and you can have as many signs on the, on the walls as possible, but I can't read either, so. Um, and then uh, understand your capacity and throughput, like how many, how many people can you get in and out, um, like how much space do you have, like all, that, all those little things. If you have a dishwasher, then you don't have people sitting there washing dishes the whole time. Um, that helps them engage the customer more. Having a mobile POS so that they're not going back and forth, back and forth from the table. Um, downtime, obviously, you know you want to be efficient. Downtime, you're paying somebody to do nothing, uh, and then um, proper inventory management is vital as well, because uh, you don't you don't want to have too much. And yeah, high efficiency, a lot more engagement, higher productivity, and less waste. Does anybody have any other questions? Can you make this uh, presentation available? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, presentation is available. All the uh, all the um, spreadsheet uh, templates are available. If you just feel feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to share and or talk more. Um, the, all those all those spreadsheets are customizable. So like you know you should customize them to your needs. The, these are customized to my needs. So um, you know it's important to do that. Um, yep. How often do you get hands on inventory? You know, like hard. Cool. Once a month. Done. Once a month? Yeah, once a month. Once a month. Yeah. All right, and then here's some links. I'll send the, uh, yeah, if you guys want this presentation, these are all a, a bunch of great links um, that I got a lot of this information from. Any other questions? Cool. Well, yeah, email me, call me, text me, whatever you want. I'm more than happy to talk. I'm here to make the industry better, so, or try to make the industry better. So, we'll, we're in it together, everybody. <laughs> Thanks.